Thank you, Chris, uh, Stephen, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, yeah, Cedar's timing, uh, as Stephen suggested, is simply wonderful. Uh, I think they've picked the very best day to uh, release what is a very important and worthwhile piece of research on what I hope will be the most significant reform of the Abbott government. I certainly believe that the Prime Minister's speech in Tenterfield on Saturday night was the most, uh, has the potential to be, along with the tax paper which will follow, to be the most transformational thing that occurs in the life of the Abbott government. I don't propose to speak precisely on the subject that I was given some time ago, which is about infrastructure. That seemed to me to be a bit of a, of a side issue in a way. I really am going to speak about the reform of the Federation in the context of the, the paper that CED has released today. My starting point is simply that we need to persuade the community that it, the Federation, is a problem. If it's not a problem, if the community is happy with mumbling and bumbling through the existing intergovernmental situation, both in terms of who does what and in terms of money, then we're obviously wasting our time here and there will be much waste of time in terms of the debate. So we do need to start with a sensible discussion about um, is it broke? Is it a case of uh, it ain't broke and don't fix it? I think the answer to that is self-evident to anyone, not just a business person, not someone operating within the Beltway in Canberra or operating in state government or in state bureaucracies. The fact is that the present federal situation provides poor outcomes, poor outcomes as to speed, poor outcomes as to effectiveness, and poor outcomes as to efficiency, cost if you like. Uh, and of course, it provides very, very poor accountability. And uh, uh, one of Kevin Rudd's more felicitous turns of phrase was about blame shifting and cost shifting. And that is, of course, endemic in fairly substantial parts of the activities of governments in Australia. I'd say in passing that I think infrastructure has actually made greater strides in terms of the institutional framework uh, than most other areas of government, both at a federal and at a state level, and I think that's in fact a directionally uh, an indication of what one can do to improve the overall Australian community approach, in that case to infrastructure. So firstly, it is a problem. Secondly, it's a problem now. Uh, it's not because we're 112 years into the Federation uh, or any of the other nice um, examples you can give. I think the truth is we've got a window of opportunity, partly because of the financial difficulty that all governments in Australia and around the world are in. That's not necessarily the real reason, and I don't think it's the real reason, but it does provide a political window of opportunity when governments have both weaker revenues and strong growth expectations in the community in terms of spending in you know, the hardy perennials like health, education and disability. But I think it's important to say this is not primarily about waste. It's easy to say, well, there is duplication, triplication, why would you do that? You should get rid of some of it and you would save some money. I think that's true. It's, I think, manifestly true. I also think it's manifestly not the real reason to worry about this. The real reason why the Federation is important is because it has a direct impact on national productivity and it has a direct impact on the quality of the, of the, national, of the services provided in the nation. So it is essentially about productivity in every sense of the word that the argument goes that for the reform of the Federation, it isn't just to get rid of a certain number of public servants at this level or that level. So it's a problem. The window of opportunity, I think, is now. Uh, the real question, the hardest question, I suspect, and it's dealt with in many different ways within the uh, CEDA document that's being released, is how do you get it done? I think it's reasonable to say that uh, there's been very little effort since the time that Bob Hawke was Prime Minister and uh, I and various other people, Wayne Goss, John Bannon, uh, were involved in 
whatever that stage of the new federalism, I think it was called. There's been very little effort. Mr Keating was opposed to it. Mr Howard and uh, Mr Costello thought it was a, a low-level issue and, of course, they had the benefit of a very strong economy and so this didn't seem to be a matter of great importance to them. And, of course, uh, uh, well, not an awful lot that was productive happened um, uh, in the years under the Rudd and Gillard governments. So I, I actually think the fact that the Prime Minister has nailed his colours to the mast is of more than symbolic importance because it really does put it on the table as an issue of pretty transformational potential as far as Australia is concerned. I think the conclusion almost everyone in the, uh, in the Cedar book and outside of it reaches is that you need a grand bargain. You can't just do this as a normal political issue and the normal, here is a federal government with public service putting up uh, things, papers and the cabinet considering them. You need a grand bargain because ultimately this is political and I don't mean liberal labour political, although it's certainly that, uh, but it need, this is ultimately about the people of Australia and how they are governed. So it needs to be seen as not a theoretical exercise, not a, an exercise in some sort of uh, academic or even uh, straight, pure public policy sense. It actually needs to be seen as something that people need to own and where the chances of success are fundamentally important on solving, in, uh, fundamentally dependent on solving the political uh, uh, issue or difficulty that's involved. Uh, I think one of the interesting things in the CEDA papers is the uh, suggestion of both the Federal Federation Reform Council uh, and more particularly perhaps Federation conventions because there is already a, an issues paper that came out of the white paper process in Canberra. I think it's a good issues paper in terms of outlining some principles. If you could get support across a wide group in the community, a wide range of organisations on the principles that you're trying to achieve, and some of them are reflected, some of them are reflected in Terry's uh, paper, which he'll probably talk about. If you get some agreement on the principles and you get it across a broader group through some sort of federation convention type process, um, then I think you're starting <coughs> to get a bit of an opportunity of doing something. It does need to be owned by all the governments. I don't know that it got off um, six months ago to the best start by being seen as so clearly a, a paper being produced in the Prime Minister's department, not because of the quality of, <coughs> of the people or the exercise, but in, a, in an ownership sense. <coughs> the Prime Minister's now created an advisory group which is across politics and across uh, backgrounds, and I think that's a substantial step forward. But ultimately, as someone said to me this morning, you can't give the states something that they have to reject. You actually need to be putting something forward by the governments and all the governments, and preferably, frankly, including local government. <coughs> Excuse me. So I do think that ownership question is important, and I think especially from Saturday on, the, hopefully the debate is moving in the direction of either producing something which has very wide ownership across government, involving the unions, involving uh, other interest groups, academia, and particularly involving ACOS and the welfare lobby, uh, because part of this will always be seen, and rightly so, in terms of does it have a, a negative impact on the poorest section of the community. So where do you start? Uh, I think there's starting to be an understanding that you should start with the who does what to whom and why. Uh, there's a bit of a tendency, as I've discovered in three or four or five uh, interviews today, to default immediately to GST and should we increase the GST and all of that. Um, I really don't think that's the logical priority, the logic st logical starting point. The logical starting point is to determine who does what, both the who and the what are important. Um, and if you get that, you determine what you're trying to fund. Uh, 
uh, I think we overdo the federal state thing, frankly. I can understand why as a former treasurer at New South Wales, but there's one lot of taxpayers. There's one tax base at the end of the day. It's not, there isn't a federal tax base and a state base. That's how it works out. But in reality, all of the people in the room are obviously the taxpayers, uh, and the bases on which you can, you know, income, consumption, land, whatever it might be, uh, are clearly spread across everyone. So um, I do think you start off with the uh, who does what to whom and why, both by function and by role. There's a good article in there uh, by, I do think if you come at this from having had a senior public service career, as Terry has, as Tanya Smith has, who wrote the piece in here, you do tend to think, oh, is this too hard? Is a grand bargain, a big picture reform too hard? I think that comes from years of um, being in the trenches and having scars of all sorts. But it, the article by uh, Ms Smith does deal with, let's divide this by policy, by regulation, by service delivery, in other words, by role, rather than by, um, you know, where should universities fall in the overall picture. <coughs> I would rather hope that we try, and the Prime Minister seemed to be going there, that we try to start with the, the bigger picture, we try to start with the clarity uh, of separation. Uh, it won't be perfect, there will be sharing, it's inevitable, but I think your starting point ought to be that you can do much better in terms of uh, clarifying who does what to whom and why. So um, I think that's where the starting point is. Uh, when you've, if and when you've managed to achieve most of that, <clears throat> you come to funding. And I want to say some of this particularly because I've noticed the response from, uh, and I don't want to make this partisan, but from uh, both Mr Shorten and Mr Wetherill, who's the only Labor Premier. And the response was, oh, look, we don't really want to go there. What we've got to do is we need our $80 billion back that was ripped away from the states in the budget. Uh, that's essentially what I, I heard Jay Wetherill say this morning. Uh, the $80 billion, just to be clear, is the funding, the extra funding levels in years five, six, seven and eight, so beyond the forward estimates. Uh, I think we really need to nail this one. The $80 billion is mythical. The $80 billion never existed. The $80 billion doesn't exist. It only exists in the sense you might say, well, the government could always borrow, the federal government could go further into deficit and it could borrow. But that money does not exist. And anyone who knows, who knew anything about it at the time of the, uh, the agreements uh, with the, I think it was the Gillard government, would know that uh, it simply doesn't exist. So we've got to have a conversation with the community which says if you really want increases in health, education, disability, if you want those very significant increases um, <clears throat> and continuing rates of growth, and there are good, case, good arguments to be made, uh, in my view more so in health and disability perhaps than in education, but there are good arguments to be made for growth beyond the inflation rate. If the community wants that to happen, then something's got to give something's got to give. It would really be tragic if the traditional sort of government opposition liberal labour view led to this process being short-circuited in some debate about, well, if we don't get our $80 billion back, which we never had, but somehow uh, that's a threshold before you could have a sensible discussion. <clears throat> that is simply treating the Australian people as fools. And uh, I do think it's about time that uh, uh, they were told the truth about some of those realities. Um, let me just say a few words about the GST. Uh, it is true that every review, and Stephen made the point that uh, uh, when the next review of tax comes up, you can be quite confident that along with the Henry Review, which wasn't allowed to talk about GST, so it came up with some surrogate for GST, but essentially it was the same idea. It was a tax effectively on consumption. The review is inevitably going to say that we should be taxing consumption more. It's inevitably going to say that the states haven't made a sufficient effort to broaden their tax base, to push, the, um, push it down and broaden it, <coughs> uh, rather than uh, and keep it narrow and at a high level. It'll inevitably say that. 
it will inevitably say uh, that uh, income taxes and company taxes are too high in Australia and that they're a major competitive disadvantage. So I think you can, you can work out, I mean, they'll say a lot more profound and useful things, no doubt, than that, that potted summary. But Stephen's right, essentially you know what the tax review is going to say. They've been done by OECD, they've been done by the IMF, they've been done by Ken Henry's group, which was a high quality you know, cross-sectional group, and by innumerable other players. Um, I just want to say, talk briefly about the argument that says you can't even consider GST or consumption tax because it's regressive. I really only want to make two related points. Firstly, what you ought to be interested in is the overall tax base. Is, it reg is the overall tax uh, system regressive or not? Are you increasing the regressive element in the overall system? If you simply pick individual taxes, uh, you are going to have no chance, no chance of getting the correct answer in terms of the impact on the average person. And the second thing that ought to be said is <clears throat> where governments are at the moment, if all this fails over the next few years, they're really going to use bracket creep. I mean, that is what both governments are doing. They're simply allowing more and more of us to go up into higher income tax brackets. That seems to be relatively politically painless. It's also far and away more regressive because what it means next year, a person on average earnings in Australia will be in the second highest tax bracket will be paying the 37%. I mean, that, that's a staggeringly un, uh, ineffective and uh, unlikely, unlikely in the sense of unfortunate result. So it'll also incidentally have a huge impact on participation over time and female participation in particular. So uh, I, I think you need to have a sensible objective argument about uh, the impact regressive or other regressive or progressive of the tax system as a whole rather than just honing in on the GST as a bit of a cudgel to play liberal labour games. Just a couple of other things in terms of how you might advance the debate. I do think, and I see Phil Gaitchens and probably other Treasury people here, I think you actually do need more hypothecation. All the evidence is it's really hard to get this stuff done. It is easier to get it if you actually say, I'm going to change this tax to that tax and I'm going to hypothecate the extra revenue. <laughs> You'll have noticed that when the NDIS came in and part of it was funded by an increase in the tax rate, the income tax rate, absolutely no one said boo because the objective a disability scheme was was so uh, attractive or considered attractive. So I do think you've got to use hypothecation in an intelligent way. I do think the states, as part of their ownership of any reform, do need to look at the state tax base. I do think land tax is probably the obvious one. It's not particularly politically easy. It's been done in Canberra, but that's a very uh, different situation. But I think the states need to own up to the fact that they need to play their part in this notion that there is one overall tax base, one lot of people and one lot of things you can tax. And uh, the states do need to look at their own efforts in this regard. And I also think, incidentally, that the, the Commonwealth uh, uh, decision to, uh, to index fuel excise was a remarkably good piece of both policy and I would have thought politics and I'm bemused that uh, it seems to be uh, hung up. There's also some papers in there and some words on uh, horizontal fiscal equalisation and this is my second last point. Apart from the fact that we have all these horrible expressions, vertical fiscal imbalance, which I've tried not to use, horizontal fiscal equalisation, and I notice Terry's heavily into subsidiarity. The trouble with all those words is that they mean something to the, uh, the policy group. They need, mean very little to the people who ultimately need <coughs> to understand and at least be accepting of the need for a change in the federal compact. For what it's worth, I don't believe that HFE is a first order issue. Um, John Brumby and I and a businessman from South Australia did spend a year or more of our lives on this and all the evidence was that frankly it's a low order issue that as the Prime Minister sort of indicated on Saturday, uh, doing it on an equal per capita basis and having the Commonwealth uh, subsidise fix 
the territories and Tasmania and South Australia uh, is likely to be the only is the best way of addressing this. The notion that forever you're going to have the Grants Commission and what goes with it, which really is a 19th or 20th century concept, uh, and that that's a useful use of anyone's time, uh, we thought was bizarre. You've got to get there, of course. You can't do it instantly. It depends a bit on the Commonwealth's uh, revenue capacity, which is under under pressure. But I certainly don't think, as I think Mr Barnett, the Western Australian Premier, got this precisely wrong. He said, you've got to fix the distribution before you do anything else. Well, I, w I think that's 180 degrees from uh, the logical outcome. The logical outcome is <clears throat> you can solve the distributional aspects uh, if you can solve the, uh, both the governance, the who does what, and the funding aspects. I think the distribution between the states is a low order issue, even though I, like other treasurers, used to put ads in the paper about it 25 years ago. <clears throat> it is frankly not where you should start this debate in my view. And finally, can I just say this? Um, I think one of the good things about at least some of the papers is that they try and um, demystify, demythologize some of the academic concepts and public policy concepts. If this is going to be a public debate, or a, <clears throat> I think Stephen calls it, or Cedar calls it, a national conversation, then you've got to do it in words and, uh, and, and arguments that the average person can understand. And I think we're not good at that. Um, in Australia, probably politicians are not good at it generally. Uh, it does need to be a broader, if you like, national discussion, and it does need to be um, demystified, and it needs to be in terms, in language, uh, that, that the public as a whole can understand. Otherwise, it'll remain a sort of mumbo-jumbo, and if it remains mumbo-jumbo, it'll never happen. So uh, that's as much as I wanted to say by way of commentary. I do add, add my words to Stephen's. Uh, I think it's an excellent uh, paper. It's got a wide range of views. They're not all meant to be entirely consistent. Uh, it'd be unlikely given the number of contributors. But uh, it basically starts from the right assumptions. This is important. Its time is now and we need the, uh, to find a way to have a sensible, mature conversation in Australia about it. Thank you very much.